My first exposure with the Persona series was back when I was at university where I heard about Persona 3 from a student in my classes who was aggressing about it, talking about how the characters suit themselves in the head to summon demons to fight other demons. At the time, it sounded messed up, especially out of context. Yet, I was curious. There were other things that built my curiosity, most notably the associating side building bonds for people to gain new abilities. Not too long after that interest in discussing, he even gave me his copy of Persona 3 Fez, which I still own today. Don't worry, he had two copies for some reason. I played it for about 10 or so hours, but I dropped it soon afterwards, mostly because university took most of my free time. While I didn't finish 3, it did lead me to the series with the likes of Persona 4 Arena and Persona 5, the latter being one of my favourite games of all time. Despite beating 4 and 5, I couldn't finish 3, no matter how many times I tried picking it up. Why was that? Was there a solid reason besides not being in the right mood to play it? That's one of the things I hope to answer in my review of Persona 3. Despite what I said earlier, I did manage to complete the main campaign as well as portable for this review. But unfortunately I have not finished the extra episode story that was included in the updated version at this point in time. Still putting in over 100 plus hours, I can say I have a lot of thoughts I would like to express. So I do hope you enjoy, but before we dive in I would love to talk briefly about the game's development. Now, you may have noticed, but Persona is a spin-off of the Sin Madami Tensei franchise, especially since it reuses a lot of the demon designs, as well as the ability to combine them to form stronger ones. Now, due to its overwhelming popularity compared to its older sibling, you may think otherwise. The original concept of Persona started with the idea for the third Sin Madami Tensei game, Sin Madami Tensei If, being set in a store full of demons, instead of the games prior being set in a post apocalypse Japan. This led to the original Persona and the Persona 2 games on the PlayStation 1. I haven't played those games, but from what I've seen in other videos, they seem more like other JRPGs. Good ones from what I've heard, but more like your traditional JRPGs. I like those games that have a stall setting, Persona 3 dives deep into the stall life sim aspect as well as introducing the calendar system that has become a mainstay since. 3 was certainly a drastic change to the series, especially since the two guys who ran the SMT and Persona series, Koji Okada and Kazuma Kanato, took a bat seat after Nocturne. The creator, Koji Okada, even left after Nocturne's release, and Kanato is mostly seen supervising many Atlas projects, with his last main roles being Strange Journey and Devil Survivor. Kazuma Kanato passed down the torch to Sengoi Sotama, who previously started out as a pizza artist for Devil Summoner, working alongside Kanato. Kanato mentions the reason why he gave the role to Sotama was to let the newer, younger staff grow and gain experience, and further explains that he tried not to, you know, put his own view on anything on Persona. That's because they're the sort of fan that likes the dark, colder atmosphere of the core Meditant series. This seems admirable as we humans evolve teaching the younger generations to carry on what we've experienced, but it probably makes sense why the series shifted in a slightly different direction, both mechanically, artistically and tonally. That doesn't mean that the third game isn't dark as it does tackle mature themes like the meaning of life and death, but from what Yito I know from the SMT franchise from Friends and its general premise, Persona is a bit more uplifting. Taking the directing role comes Tatsuo Hasino, where he joined Atlas during SMT IF's development as a designer. Kanato was still credited in P3 for his famous demon designs, so he had some influence in many Atlas titles to this day. With a new direction, Persona 3 originally came out late during the PlayStation 2 lifespan in Japan 2006, with the US setting their hands on it in 2007, and the Europeans also getting in on the phone in 2008. Persona 3 got an updated version soon after with Persona 3 Fez, which was released a year later in each region, except for the EU which was released in the same year. Europeans who probably got the original version must have gotten ripped off. 
Thankfully, if you had the original game, you could carry over your save data and use the registered personas in the compendium and social rankings. Persona 3 Portable was released on the PSP in Japan 2009 the US in 2010 and Europe in 2011 and last year on all modern systems. With the history lesson out of the way, let's dive into the general premise. The story begins with a transfer student, aka the hero of the story, who walks to his new dorm, starting a new life studying at Decathlon High School. But not all as it seems, as while walking to his dorm, the sky suddenly turns green with a horde of coffins lying around the city. No, he doesn't notice right away. He must have been lost in his tunes. He enters a dorm where he meets a child in what appears to be a prison outfit who asks him to sign the dorm book and then vanishes. Spooky. He then meets two girls given in the dorm, Yutari and Metsuru, who greet him. After a first day of packing and school, he goes to sleep. However, his bedtime is interrupted, as the dorm seems to be under attack by mysterious shadows called, well, shadows. Yutari and the transfer student head up to the roof, but not before being attacked by one of them. Yutari points a gun to her head, but a set of slaps her, knotting her gun to the floor. The hero grabs the gun and suits himself without much hesitation, which summons beings known as Personas, ripping the shadow to shreds, yeeding to a victory, and an unconscious boy. He soon wakes up a week later in the hospital, where the play is given information on what shadows and Personas are, as well as the Dark Hour, which is a hidden hour when the chart strikes midnight, as well as the reason why people are suffering from Apathy Syndrome, aka Depression. During that time, a majority of people are in coffins, unaware what is happening. However, there are a minority that do experience the nightmare that is the Dark Hour. Some of them are defenseless, becoming prey to the shadows, but there are a small number of people who are able to combat them with the power of summoning personas. During the Dark Hour, the school seems to transform into a giant tower called Tartarus. What is Tartarus? Why is there a Dark Hour and shadows to begin with? And how can they fix it and return everything back to normal? Well, that's what the player, possibly you, are ready to find out, as you have one in-game year to climb the top of Tartarus, defeating the shadows, and managing your time interacting with various people. Their opening hooked me with curiosity the first time I played it. It's haunting and mysterious, with the animated touchings, especially with the heroes awakening. In fact, Persona 3 oozes with style. People praise 5's UI design to hell and back, but I think the same can apply here too, using the colour blue as its central focus. Blue is often described as a cold colour that has loads of meanings in different cultures. In Iran, blue is the colour for mourning, which ties to a lot of characters in this story. It's a calm colour, but can also symbolise depression and sadness, which again can tie to the apathy syndrome people suffer in this plot. The opening to the original game is a fantastic intro that is very artsy, using plenty of flat colours like blue, red and white, along with thrown in Latin words like Memento Mori, explaining the narrative in a subtle way. It's one I can watch consecutively and the opening song, Burn My Dread, is an absolute banger. Fairs and Portable have their own intro too, but not nearly as good as the original, with Fairs mostly being chips of the game and a new episode story, but thankfully both games still include the original opening cinematic. The music is a treat to the ears, covering mostly rap and hip hop, with some elements of rock for some of the various boss music. After hearing the likes of his Persona works and Catherine, I can say Sergi Maduro is probably one of my favourite composers. The vocals are provided by Yotus Juice, who does the rapping, and Yumi Kawamura, who does a lot of the female vocal parts of the tracks, and the combination of the two is stellar. The main battle theme, Mass Destruction, plays throughout the entire game, which may get tiring for some people, considering you will be doing a lot of the combat in a 70 plus hour JRPG, but for me, it's very taxi, 
So much it got in my head throughout the majority of last year. I was glad it was added in Smash Ultimate. My other favourites include Master of Shadow, that was used in the major boss fights of the game, Change in Seasons, that was used in the later half of the, for the life sim parts of the game, the final boss theme, and the credits theme. There was one track I wasn't bid on, that being the Tartarus theme, as despite having different variations, throughout the campaign, it just became background noise, and unfortunately, Tartarus itself is nothing interesting to yet at, either yet and quite bland, despite changing in its visuals every now and then. It doesn't help that this is where you are spending most of your time. The presentation is great, with a fantastic soundtrack and art style, but is yet down with some bland written environments and stiff written character models. The plot goes at a snail's pace, as while we do find out that defeating the 12 Arcana Shadows could ye to bring things back to normal, Nothing major happens for hours until you get to August. While 4 and 5 have certain pacing issues, they have at least things to keep me motivated, like 4's murder mystery and the personal conflicts with the party in 5. 3's biggest conflict for a dead sign of the campaign are the major faceless shadows that you see at the very end of every month, which felt more like a grind than a source of motivation. You do have villains with actual faces, but besides one of them, they might as well not be here. Strader is such an undercooked group. I was praying for something exciting to happen. The story has snippets of good material that did get me thinking about the topics it presents, even after putting the game down, but they were few and far between. There was also one scene that aged like milk. Well, while the plot can be a sword, I used to have characters to keep me entertained, right? Well, the main cast is a mixed bad. Most of them have at least one moment to sign, but I wouldn't say I cared for a lot of them. Fuka is meant to be a psy, timid girl who tends to the very bad you, but when you see her in person, along with the buddies, she just seems pretty casual, even befriending one of her buddies. Like, what? It feels wrong befriending someone who basically tortured you daily. Besides that, Futa is just a dull character who has a lot of things to say, but doesn't at the same time. It doesn't help that her voice direction sounds wooden. Besides one moment, Ken is just near. Akihito is someone I wanted to like more, especially how he plays in both this game and for Arena. But besides wishing to become stronger, to protect the ones he loves, and having one dead scene, he doesn't have much going for him. It's the same because he's one of the first characters you are introduced to. Still, there are some good characters. Mitsuru is someone I didn't expect to like as much when I first played 3, but once I got pretty far, she developed into a decent character with her own personal arc. Idis is an interesting character that covers the discussion of what it truly means to Yiv. It sucks that it takes till near the end of the campaign to get that point, as during the rest of the game, she's just a quirky robot character. I'm a sucker for robots, especially ones with extensive crisis, so she goes in the good books. To me, there are two characters that are carrying this yet lost a party, being Yukari and Junpei. They have the benefit of being some of the first characters you meet in the game, so you see them grow throughout the story, especially Junpei who starts out as a selfish fast kid, who is excited to have superpowers, to someone who generally takes the situations a lot more seriously. If there is one thing I praise free compared to its sequels, is that both Yukari and Junpei don't immediately gravitate towards the player right off the back, with Yukari even being more close off towards the player, not fully trusting him, and Junpei taking out his jealousy on the player for being the leader of the group, and his wildcard gift. I honestly wish that some of the main characters were given more time to develop, but thanks to the introductions of the associates, you are able to spend time with the characters during your free time. Well, at least the 80s, as in the PS2 titles, you couldn't interact with the ads. I'm not so why, since these are the people I would be going to Tartarus with. It would have given me time to get to know my boys, but I ask what you see in the main story is what you get. Yukari's story is about her confrontation with her mother and trying to deal with her father's death. 
getting you know more of a past, making it a decent one. I just associate as exclusive to fairs and portable, and it's one of my favourites in the game, being centred around what it means to be human and the value of life. I didn't really care much about Future Associate, and I didn't get far into Mitsuru's. One of the reasons is in order to gain access to the girl Associates, you have to max out all your social stats. Charm for Yukaris, Courage for Futures, and Academics for Mitsuru's. The other reason is that the opportunity to talk to Yukari, Mitsuru, and Idis only comes up during certain dates with Mitsuru being near the end of the game and Idis during the end game, which is absurd. They've been with me the entire game encountering Eldritch Horrors. I can at least understand why Idis' one takes a while, but why does it take that long to initiate associate with Mitsuru? She was there from the first hour of the game. Outside of the main cast, the player can interact with a bunch of people, each with their own arcana that allows you to gain buffs during the dungeon part of the game. A few of them are Boren like Yuto, who I had to look up a name while writing the script. One of them is absolutely dreadful being Nozomi, who is perhaps one of the most unlikable people with no redeeming qualities, but there are a couple that I enjoyed that I would like to mention. The old couple at the bookstore is a sweet one. The couple lost their son due to a car crash and trying to preserve his memories by keeping a memorial tree at Decaton High School as their son was a teacher there. This one hits home as the older gentleman suffers with I believe is Alzheimer's as I knew someone dear to me who suffered from it. While I found a lot of the associates mediocre, I will say it does include one of my favourites in the franchise, that being the Sun Arcana Akinari. He is someone you meet at the shrine who is suffering from an unknown disease that is slowly killing him. He is struggling to live his remaining days and is trying to find comfort in death and embracing the life he has remaining. He loves getting lost in his books and before he leaves this world, he writes a story about a pink alligator and a bird that basically reflects the beautiful memories that he will leave behind. Honestly, it's one of my favourite parts of the game's narrative, even more so than some parts of the main plot. A majority of the scenes are connected to the themes of life and death like the old couple, remembering their son by preserving his jealousy, Akinari making peace with death and enjoying the life he has remaining, as well as some others like the monk in the bar trying to make amends with his family while he has the chance. At least a lot of them have someone close to them passing away. It's such a shame that I didn't find a lot of them compelling. Being the first game to introduce Sociants, it has a lot of flaws. So you are able to reverse Sociants and even ruin one entirely, which I can get behind. It makes these relationships feel a bit more realistic, as friendships unfortunately do sometimes wither. These can be traded if you say the wrong thing, not hang around with them in 60 days, or break your promises to them when planning a day out with them. It's something I would like to see in future titles, and it's easy to avoid them entirely. The problem is when you get to a certain rank with one of those, minus Maiko and Maya, they will become more intimate forcing the player to be romantically interested in them, which is already a problem, but that means if you decide to talk to another girl, then the previous one will get jealous and making you go through hoops to get back on track with them. This could lead to reverse associates and ending theirs entirely, which sucks. Don't these people know what it means to have a platonic relationship? Well, according to an interview in the Official Design Works book with Hasino and Sejima, and they admit that they weren't successful in talking with girls in school, with Hasino admitted that he never successfully forged a true friendship with a girl in real life. With Sotoma mentioned now that I'm in my 30s, I'm open to the notion that is possible. No, back in high school, I admit I didn't get girls that way. I guess there were times that some people thought that way, especially hormonal teenagers, but there have been people who have been friends with people of the opposite gender. Plus it makes it difficult to achieve other associates in the game, which may have been the intention, but it's still stupid. Yucky for me, I was aware of this way before I decided to cover this game, which made me plan around it. And if you already matched out what the associates, you can carry on with the next one, no problem.
One of my favourite things about this series is trying to plan out my days, figuring when to socialise, race stats, or when to grind in the dungeons. There are a total of 22 socialings, with a couple of them level up automatically throughout the game, and the ones that aren't are statted between various states. So if you want to chat with, for example, Yuto, you have to meet her after store either Wednesdays or Saturdays. During the day, it's not much of a problem, especially during the early and mid game, but it's when you get to the evenings is when it becomes an issue. There are only two socialings during the evenings with Tanaka, who is only available during Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays, and Mutatsu, who is only available during Thursday to Sundays, which isn't much. I had a moment where I managed to finish Nizinks pretty early, which may be my fault, but I had a period where my nighttime activities were just either grinding in Tartarus, studying, or raising my Persona stats in the arcades. I won't be mentioning any Yate Story stuff, but I will be putting a spoiler warning just in case if you want to go in blind, but I will be mentioning something that happens pretty late, so just stick to this time just in case. There is one part in December where you unfortunately cannot enter Tartarus, so if you already mapped out the two Celsius at night and increase your academics, then you cannot do anything else besides raising Persona stats. It was so boring and there are times where I couldn't do anything besides heading out to combat, which leads me to the dungeon and fusion part of the game. Like the other games, you can fuse two or more personas together to create a stronger one, with a few moves they can inherit. It's a fun system that blends well with the socialized part of the game, as the higher your social stack, aka your social arcana, the more experience that persona with the same arcana will earn. You can create some versatile and strong ones, leading to some cool player expression. I will admit that I would have spent ages just to find different combinations. My only issue is that the moves the Persona will inherit will be randomly chosen. Thankfully, you can check what they will learn before you fuse, and you can go back and see at the same Personas to get different moves you may want, but that can take a while to set up. Quite often after a battle, you can gain more experience, health, gold, and even new Personas, which is nice. This all seems fun, but the dungeon stuff has a lot of problems. Firstly, outside of bosses and big events, the game is entirely set around in Tartarus, which besides the cosmetic chains, every blot is structurally the same, all being randomly generated. There are times where certain events can happen, such as being able to gain more experience points, the party being temporarily separated, suddenly you turn in pits blat, etc. But for the most part, you are wandering around hearing the same dungeon tune for 70 plus hours. Combat is similar to 4 and 5 using the one more system, where if you use an attack, the opponent is weak against, then you can attack again, and if you manage to knock the opponents off the feet, then you can perform an all hour attack. But besides the all hour attack, the opponent can do the same to you. I'm actually a fan of the one more system. But I hated the combat. If a person with a melee weapon misses, then they would trip, making them vulnerable to enemy attacks, and won't be able to attack on the next turn. The biggest issue for me though is that you only have control of the main protagonist, as your party is controlled by AI. Like, what? You do have some influence on their turns by going to the tactics demand and selecting whether or not they want to either attack a particular target, heal, or let them do their own thing. But sadly, some of these will only be available throughout the story, and sometimes they won't listen to you and do their own thing. To be fair, the AI isn't terrible, but there were times where I died due to my party's actions. There was one part of the game where I was fighting a mini boss where my only control character got charmed, which made me unable to control my only character I had the option to control in the first place for a good number of turns that led me to my death. I was angry that I caught it a day. The thing is, the developers intended to remove control over your party for the sake of immersion, but I would rather have the ability to control my party and have a fun time than be frustrated over immersion. 
Like the other games, if your main character dies, then it's game over, and if you are playing on normal or higher, then you will be knocked back to the title screen and the last time you saved. I always dreaded when I had to do Tartarus, as I did not want to participate in combat. Fez does include a lot of new stuff, like including a new ID associate, new personas, the addition of hard mode, and a 30 plus hour epilogue story called The Answer. The Answer is something I wanted to finish, but after playing an hour of it, I decided not to bother, as it's just the combat parts of the game, which I already dreaded, but a lot harder. While I have a lot of thoughts on Persona 3 Fez, I'm going to wait on giving my verdict at the moment, as it's not another version on the PSP. Portable is more of a demate, being on a yes powerful hardware, as it removes free roaming entirely besides the Tartarus parts, as well as removing animated cutscenes, going for a more visual novel approach, using a lot of still images, which does yesen the emotional impact of the story. Some of these still images also don't get so good, especially on a computer monitor. Still, the voice acting is still intact, so not all is lost. Portable does include new features, with its biggest additions being the female MC that includes new lines, scenes, and associates in her route. You can even interact with the boys during this route, which slightly gives them more information about them, No, my opinion on Atahito is still the same. I'm glad this version allows you to refuse having romantic feelings of the opposite gender, as now it can be easier to raise your associates. The female hero also gets new songs exclusive to hers, being a lot more poppy than the males. I love her daily sim life songs like Way of Life and Time. No, I'm not big on a battle theme wiping it all out. It isn't as catchy as Mass Destruction. Portable came out just after Vanilla Persona 4, so it inherited some of 4's approaches in combat. You now have the option to control all your party members with spank this. This does make some bosses a bit easier, but I would rather have an easier time than dying to deaths now out of my hands. Multiple target attacks will now grant you a one more if you at yeast attack one enemy with their weakness that isn't already knocked down. Party members will also take the bullet for the MC when a fatal blow happens, and now there is a dedicated guard command making it easier to soften blows from dangerous attacks and preventing the person to be knocked down from an attack they are weak against. I'm also glad that characters can immediately take action after getting backed up from a knockdown, as it can lead to some yes BS moments. Still cards are also introduced that you can get from the other not personas and other methods. These can give personas extra skills that otherwise they wouldn't be able to learn normally. Door chats and also around you happen that it make combat easier. These elements make portable an easier experience that some people may not deal with, but for me, it made my experience of the game more bearable. Portable did get a release on modern platforms with its own quality of life improvements such as things in a difficulty at any time, gaining more experience in battle, higher frame rate and resolution, and being able to retry a boss battle even after death. Sadly, in this game gets ugly when it's upscaled to full screen with backgrounds being upscaled using AI, and the sound quality being bad in some places, like when you hear the persona being summoned or when you perform a critical attack. Out of both versions, Fez is better narratively due to the assistance of animated and in-game cutscenes, as well as including a new epilogue, but for accessibility, Portable is a better experience. No, not by much. Persona 3 is a game I really wanted to like, but it has a lot of problems for me being its pacing, half the roster, and Tartarus. I can tell this was the first attempt using the candy system and associates, and given how well 4 and 5 turned out, it was a step in the right direction for Atlas. I just can't go back to these games, but I can see why many people like them. Some people love this game, and a few people I know say this is up there as their favourites. It was popular enough to have plenty of spin-offs, mangas, four movie adaptations, and even stage plays, so Atlas must have been doing something right. 
While I don't know how this story is told, I can appreciate the subject it is trying to tackle and does execute some of these in a mature way. For me, as someone who's more of a gameplay player, Femin can only go so far. It does have the potential to be amazing, and I'm glad that Atlas decided to remake it in the first place. Persona 3 Reload could be something great. I do hope you enjoy my review, and I would like to know if there's a game you want to love but just couldn't get into. Let me know in the comments below, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Yeah.